So with that, as Shanique was said, we are gonna talk about bull selection tonight. All right, well, one of the first things you wanna think about is what is the goal of your operation? Are you looking at selling stocker feeder kids at weaning? Are you looking at selling kids into a specific branded program that may have some uh, certain breed requirements you have to follow? Are you looking at retaining ownership of those animals all the way through the feedlot? Are you looking at retaining maybe partial ownership or some co-ownership with the feedlot? Are you looking to primarily sell replacement heifers or keep replacement heifers for your operation? Are you trying to raise seed stock to sell bulls to somebody else? And definitely realize if you're in the seed stock side of things, you're gonna to have to spend more on those bulls than what you're hoping to sell those sons for. Um, so depending on what your goal is, is really going to kind of shift what direction you want to go in the bull selection process. When we think about that process, I kind of like to lay out what the thought process would generally be so you can kind of work through that scenario. The first thing is we need to decide what breeds appropriate uh, for your operation and your goals. Who or where do you want to buy those bulls from? Kind of set a budget for your operation or what's realistic uh, for you to spend or what are you comfortable spending. We need to make sure we evaluate those bulls from a visual appraisal standpoint. We need to evaluate those bulls based on their EPDs and in some situations, some individual data as well. And then there may be some other criteria that we're going to look at and want to evaluate uh, those bulls for. So first thing, kind of as a reminder, when we think about breed or breed types, when we talk about our British breeds, those would be things like Hereford, Red Angus, Angus, and Shorthorn would be the four most common there. When we think about our continental breeds, and typically we think about a little higher cutability and maybe a little heavier muscling with these breeds, think about things like uh, Charlay, Simmental, Limousine, Gelvy, Kianina, Main Anju, uh, Bronby would kind of fit there. The most common would definitely be Charlay, Simmental, and then Gelvy. And then we think about our Boss Indicus breeds. So we think about things like Straight Brahmin, and then we think about the breeds that were developed here in the U.S. that a lot of times are referred to as American breeds, so things like beef, oops, Things like Beef Master, Santa Gertrudis, Brangus, Brayford, Simbra would all be breeds that are developed here in the U.S. And we really think about these as adding some um, heat tolerance into our cattle and definitely some maternal genetics as well. So if you're just looking at raising cattle to sell those kids at your local auction market, there's some things you wanna think about to avoid significant discounts when you go to sell those kids from a breed standpoint. We want those kids to be at least a quarter percent British. So think about Hereford, Angus, Red Angus, no more than a half continental, uh, no more than a quarter Boss Indicus, and no more than a quarter Dairy Longhorn. Now that doesn't mean that you may always have the highest selling calves, but you'll definitely have calves that are going to be very desirable by a large group of buyers, and you'll definitely avoid some significant discounts there. So when we think about individual data, or that individual performance data, um, we're thinking about things like scrotal circumference, what was the birth weight of those bulls, what's the weaning weight, what's the yearling weight. Uh, in some breeds, we may really just focus on those EPDs and some of our smaller breeds where we don't have quite as much genomic information yet, don't have as big of a database. We're going to look at uh, that individual performance data as well. Thing is, make sure you don't look at data that's actually duplicating other stuff. So sometimes you'll see uh, adjusted weaning weight and then you'll see weaning weight per day of age or yearly weight and then yearly weight per day of age. Realize that weight per day of age is duplicating what we see in those other values. So pick whichever one you're most comfortable with and then just focus on that. Average daily gain when those bulls are on test, uh, I'm gonna tell you that's something I really don't look at a tremendous amount anymore. I used to look at it a little bit more, never the highest on my list, but I'd look at it just to see how those bulls were may have performed post weaning, but really that's going to be captured in the yearling weight. 
Uh, sometimes those bulls that are really high on average daily gain, it may have just meant the cow did milk real well. Probably for most of this yearly weight is going to be sufficient. We don't need to really focus on that average daily gain there. But that would be some of that individual performance data when we're thinking about from a weight standpoint. We also think about individual performance data as it would relate back to the carcass. And in a live animal, uh, we're going to look at that from an ultrasound standpoint. So we could look at ribeye area. We could look at percent IMF or intermuscular fat. In a live animal, we're typically going to refer to it as intermuscular fat. On a carcass, we're going to refer to that as marbling. And then back fat and rump fat. Most of the time, you won't see rump fat reported, even though it's measured. You'll just see the back fat measurement. So when it comes to these individual performance data, we need to ask ourselves, can we compare performance data from one operation to another? And the answer, as many of you are probably already aware, is no, we really can't compare that data because we don't know what the environmental conditions, uh, how they may have varied from operation to operation and what the feeding program, how that varied. Um, if we look at weaning weight and we're in a really low rainfall environment, those calves just aren't gonna wean as heavy as if we were in a higher rainfall environment. And so when we look at individual performance data, we really just wanna focus on that within that particular operation. So the way we can compare from operation to operation, that's where EPDs come in. And just remember EPD stands for expected progeny differences. Basically it's just an estimated measure of the genetic impact of a parent, whether that be the bull or the cow, on his or her offspring. Kind of rather than going through a lot of definitions on EPDs, the easiest way to explain them is just to work through some examples. So let's just say we had two bulls here. We had bull A and bull B, and bull A had a yearling weight EPD of 84. Bull B had a yearling weight EPD of 104. So that's a 20 pound difference there. So what that tells us is if we bred both of those bulls to similar type cows, on average, we would expect the calves from bull B to be 20 pounds heavier at year. Okay. And doesn't tell us that they're going to be a certain weight. It just says if we breed them to similar cows and we manage them the same, we would expect on average bull B, his calves to be 20 pounds heavier uh, at yearling time. Another way we can compare EPDs or evaluate EPDs is compare them back to the breed average. So here, let's just say the breed average was three and bull A was a negative one. So if we look at that absolute difference there, don't get hung up on positives or negatives. Just look at the absolute difference compared to another bull or compared back to the breed average. So bull A, he's gonna be four pounds lighter than breed average, so on average, his calves would be four pounds under breed average for birth weight. So we could definitely say he was an easy calving bull. If we look at bull B at 1.5, he's still a pound and a half below breed average. So again, he would be a fairly easy calving bull as well. Like I said, don't get hung up on the positive or negative. What we wanna focus on is how do those two bulls compare to each other or how do those bulls compare back to the breed average. There's a lot of different EPDs out there. Uh, all the breed associations, or I should say all the major breed associations are gonna have a core set, but then they'll have some additional EPDs as well. But some of the ones we'll see are things like calving ease direct, uh, and the higher the number there, the easier calving they're gonna be. Birth weight, uh, lower number, easier calving, weaning weight, yearling weight, scrotal circumference, those are gonna be pretty common across all the breeds. And if we look at what we would call our maternal EPD, so some examples there would be things like heifer pregnancy. Not all breeds have that EPD, but we are seeing more and more that have that. If you were gonna keep replacement heifers, that would definitely be something we would wanna look at. Milk EPD, that's gonna be one that all the breeds will have. Realize though that's not telling us how much that cow is gonna milk. What that milk EPD is telling us is what is the difference in weaning weight due to additional milk production. Um, and then some breeds will have mature weight. So if we were keeping replacement heifers, 
how heavy would we expect those mature cows to be relative to other cows in the breed. We have our carcass EPDs, and you'll see that as either marblin or IMF when we're, we're talking about those two. Uh, some breeds use marblin, some breeds use IMF, not any better or worse, just some breed differences there. CW is carcass weight, so if you were retaining animals through the feedlot, that would be something to pay attention to. If you're selling at weaning or yearling time, really not something to worry about there. Ribeye area, that's one that probably gets way more focused than what it really deserves. Um, most cattle now have plenty big ribeyes. In fact, because of how heavy cattle are getting coming out of the feedlot, uh, a lot of times the packers to get the right size ribeye that little cap muscle that's on top of the ribeye, they were actually removing that these days in most instances and selling it separate. So you just see the middle portion of the ribeye because we got some such large ribeyes due to carcass weight in a lot of cattle. So probably not something I'm really gonna focus on. And then uh, our fat EPDs. And then some EPDs we're starting to see more now or what we may describe as management EPD. So docility is a big one and we see several breeds that have that. And then we're starting to see uh, at least one breed that has it published and some other breeds that are working on some foot EPD. So looking at claw set and foot angle and I'll show you some more of that a little bit later. But those would be examples of some of the EPDs we would see across the breeds. Another thing we can look at when it comes to EPDs is what we call percentile tables. So you can go to the breed website in most situations and download these percentile tables and most associations will publish them for what they call non-parents, active sires, meaning that bulls that have actually sired calves and then active dams. The one you really are gonna wanna focus on when you're buying bulls is this non-parent. And so you can get this percentile table and make sure you get a current one. So typically they'll update those percentile tables a couple times a year. So like here, I still have, when I made this slide was back in 2013, I wouldn't want to use the 2013 percentile table currently. I'd want to go ahead and get a 2020. But the way that would work is if I wanted to find a bull that was in the top 10% of the breed, for calving ease, then I could look over here and that would tell us he needed to have a birth weight EPD of less than 2.1. If I wanted a bull in the top 25% for weaning weight, he would need to be 32 or higher. If I was looking at yearling weight, he could be 57 or higher. So this is a way you can look at bulls and see how they fall within the breed compared to their contemporaries. So what information goes into those EPD calculations? We're gonna be looking at things like performance of that animal. Once it starts to have any progeny and that data gets reported back to the breed association, performance of its progeny, performance of its relatives, and then in some breed associations that we have genomic testing, that genomic information actually gets calculated into the EPD as well. So genomic testing and markers are something that's received a lot of attention lately. It's a very complex topic, so we'll just kind of hit on some of the high points there. When we think about genomic testing, we can break it into what we call qualitative and quantitative measurements. Qualitative just means it's kind of a yes, no type situation. So an example of something like that would be coat color. So you could actually test uh, certain breeds to see what genes they're carrying for coat color to see if maybe they're carrying a, res a recessive gene, a diluter gene, or a wild type gene or something like that. When we talk about our non-Brahmin influence cattle, we can actually look at horn polled genes. Remember polled is dominant to horn. So if that animal is carrying two copies of the polled gene, we would call them homozygous polled. If they were carrying one copy of the pole gene and one copy of the horn gene, that would be a heterozygous pole animal. And if it's polled, you can't tell whether it's carrying one copy or two copies of that pole gene. So that's something we could actually look at with genetic testing. Now, when it comes to our Brahmin influenced animals, there's actually a modifier gene that's gonna be involved there that we just don't have a test for at this point in time. So that's why I said, 
It really applies to our boss taurus breeds. Genetic defects, examples of genetic defects would be things like developmental duplication, curly calf, uh, and then there's several other ones. And realize with genetic defects, we're gonna continue to find more defects as we move forward. So don't get panicked if you do, if you're a breeder and you do have an animal that comes up with the new genetic defect as we start to identify more of those. Some of those we really need to focus on and try to breed those out of the population. Some of them may not be quite as critical. And then a big part of genetic testing is gonna be parentage. Once we started doing more genetic testing, we started finding out we had a lot of animals misidentified on their pedigree. And pretty easy to see how we can misidentify a sire, you know, pull the wrong straw semen out of a semen tank, bull jumps the fence, something like that. So everybody kind of expected that. One of the kind of surprising things is sometimes we found we actually had the wrong dam assigned uh, back to that calf. And, the way that would typically happen is one is maybe something, it was just a typo, something got misentered. But it, a way it's happened a lot of times is when we go in and synchronize a bunch of cows and breed them at the same time. So we have a bunch of them dropping calves at very close times to each other. Sometimes if two of those cows lay down at the same time and calve, when they get up, they may actually swap calves. And so we saw that and we were able to identify some of that through genetic testing. So that's been a real huge benefit of genetic testing is just make sure we get that parentage uh, identified accurately. And then that helps us improve our EPDs as well. When we think about quantitative genetic markers, we think about those as numeric type traits. So weaning weight, yearling weight, birth weight, uh, those kind of things. Remember, genetic testing is never going to replace EPDs. With genetic testing and numeric traits, what we really need is a lot of data collected on, from an individual performance data on those animals and then genomic testing on those same animals. And that's going to help our genomics moving forward and really help us get better estimates on those EPDs. So those breed associations that have tested hundreds of thousands of animals they're way ahead of breed associations that may have only tested a thousand or two animals. Now it's beneficial in both situations, but it's gonna be more beneficial, the more animals that we have data on plus that we've tested. So genetic markers are not gonna replace EPDs. The best way to use them from a numeric standpoint is actually in that genomically enhanced EPD that the breed association is reporting out. And then realize that that genetic marker only explains a portion of the genetic variation for that trait. So it helps us get closer, but it doesn't help us get to the exact point on those animals. Some other criteria that we may look at when we're evaluating bulls or selecting bulls is docility is a huge one in my mind. So if you're buying that's something most people are paying attention to. If you're a breeder, I would strongly encourage you to pay attention to that. We've always known docility was a convenience trait, but over the last 10 to 15 years, research has showed us there's some performance benefits as well. So something we definitely wanna pay attention to. Horn versus polled. I'm gonna tell you there's an advantage when we think about that on those polled animals about not having to dehorn those calves or not having to tip those calves uh, when they get to the feedlot. What I mean by tip, if that horn's there at the feedlot, they won't dehorn them. They'll just take and remove the end of the horn off, and that's what we're calling tipping. But there's actually some marketing programs that require those animals to be polled, and I think that'll be a bigger thing moving forward. So that's something definitely want to pay attention to. And anytime I can buy a polled bull, I, I definitely want to look at that. And even in some of our breeds that we used to not think about having very many polled animals, we're starting to see more and more so we can really select and get uh, some good quality animals there. Uh, our Brahmin cattle, for example, they've really increased the number of, of polled animals they have in that breed. We're seeing similar things in some of the American breeds as well. In Texas, uh, especially East Texas, and as we move south, we live in a hot, humid environment. So hair coat characteristics 
are important. And we're actually starting to see that in other environments. You get over into the fescue belt, they're actually starting to really pay a lot of attention to hair coat characteristics and shedding ability on those animals. So that's something we wanna look at. It's fine if they develop a nice heavy coat during the winter, uh, but we really wanna to try to look for those animals that shed that coat off and they're not carrying that heavy coat into the summer. So that may be something you're looking at on your cattle. And there are some breed associations who are working on some EPDs for that trait. Uh, color is something that can be very important to certain people or if you're marketing into a certain program that may be important. So that may be something to consider as well. Uh, as a nutritionist and somebody who buys bulls, one thing that's really important to me is how were those bulls developed? Uh, unfortunately, because people like to brag about how high that yearling weight was and those kind of things, a lot of bulls we end up pushing too hard on feed and getting them way bigger than what we need to. And that leads to problems uh, down the road, especially from a founder and foot abscess standpoint. So I really like to know how those bulls were developed. I'll tell you personally, I've gotten to the point where I've started buying young bulls just so I can uh, develop them out on grass uh, myself. What kind of reputation does that operation have? Uh, do they have a good reputation or do they have a reputation of being kind of hard to deal with if there is a problem with those bulls? So that's something to think about. And then if you're keeping replacement heifers, I definitely want to see that cow herd. Uh, so I would ask to see that cow herd. Now don't show up on sale day if it's a, a big auction sale, expecting to see the cow herd you would want to make that contact earlier uh, and have those conversations and see if you can get in the cow herd and look at them, especially any bulls you may be interested in. If you're buying bulls private treaty, a lot of times that's a whole lot easier to see that cow herd. So something to think about there if you're keeping heifers. If you're keeping heifers, I really wanna know what the udder quality is. And that's gonna be one of the reasons I wanna get in the cow herd and make sure I look at them and think about that. Um, there is at least one breed out there that has some EPDs for udder quality. Um, so if you're in that breed and that's something you're interested in, there's actually some EPDs to look at that. And then another consideration, uh, especially if you're keeping replacement heifers, is to look at that pedigree a lot from the standpoint of just to make sure we avoid or reduce inbreeding in those animals. So we don't go by bulls now, three years go by bulls out of that same sire, three years uh, by bulls out of that same sire, so that we're constantly interjecting the same genetics back into those replacement heifers we keep them. We wanna think about that pedigree and do pay attention to that to reduce inbreeding. Unfortunately, something that we used to pay more attention to that's kind of fallen by the wayside and starting to pick back up now a little bit more, I think, is visual appraisal. And so some people get so obsessed at looking at those EPDs and data, they don't pay enough attention to those bulls from a visual appraisal standpoint. And we still need to make sure those bulls are structurally sound and correct. We wanna make sure those bulls have some muscle shape and expression because a lot of times when we're selling cattle, it's gonna be from a visual evaluation as well as how much they weigh. And then we wanna make sure they have some volume and capacity. So we can't forget the visual appraisal standpoint. Now structural correctness uh, and soundness can be, true structural correctness can, can get really detailed, but I'm gonna tell you, just focus on the big things. And I actually have some videos we'll look at here in just a second that will kind of help with that. Uh, one of the things you, you want to look at is look at the feet of those bulls. Uh, and this top row is what we refer to as foot angle. And so five is going to be desirable. This is what we're looking for. We don't want those animals to be real straight from a pasture standpoint, which that'll make a foot like this, which the foot, that's not a problem, but that real straight pasture will become a problem over time. And those two things go together. The other thing we wanna make sure is those animals aren't getting real shallow in their heel, which leads to real long toes and leads to weak pastures. And a lot of times you'll actually see those toes uh, start to get painful on those animals because of the way they grow. So this is what we want. 
This is not perfect, but pretty good. And then as we move away, we get worse on both directions. The other thing to look at is the claw set. I'll, I'll tell you, I'll probably look at foot angle a little bit more than I do claw set, but I will look at both of, both of them. This is gonna be ideal here. Obviously you don't want those toes crossing over because that gets painful and you get some lameness in those animals. And then you don't want those uh, very small claws that are really splayed out um, because that's not real good from a longevity standpoint either. So if you just kind of spend a little time looking at the feet on those bulls, that can be very informative from a structure standpoint on the rest of the animal because those things are tied in together. So a lot of times if we think about these animals that get down here on this end of the scale, those animals also get very straight in their hawk. We would call this straight-legged or post-legged. That's not a good thing because you think about when that bull breeds, all of his weight gets shifted back to those back legs. And if he's too straight in the hawk, those hawks are gonna get sore. He's not gonna to wanna to breed cows in that situation. So this would not be desirable. This is what we're looking for. We're looking at a little, a little bit of angle in this hawk. Now we don't want that hawk where it comes down and then it curves back here. That would be sickle hawk. We want that leg to be straight and then have some flex to that hawk in that situation. So you can look at those things. And like I said, they're all gonna be tied together. So typically when we're, we're right here and we're right on the, um, the foot as well, those things go together. So what I'm gonna do here is show you a few videos. The easiest way I think to start learning about structure and really identify if there's a problem is just watch those bulls walk. If they walk and it looks like they're walking pretty smooth without any difficulty, we're probably pretty good. If those bulls look uncomfortable or stiff in the way they walk, it's probably an issue with the structure issue there. Maybe we got some foot abscesses there or some founder there, and those would be bulls we wanna avoid. So this first bull I'm gonna show you is actually a bull that I would consider to be pretty good from a structural standpoint. He, he moves pretty free and easy off of both ends. So we'll just kind of watch him walk for a second there. You can see he's actually got some flex to that hawk. So he, he flexes it nice and easy, has some slope and angle to his shoulder here. We want about a 45 degree angle, makes him walk nice and smooth in that situation. Maybe a little high in the tail head, but that's really not going to hurt him from a structural standpoint. That's more from a visual standpoint. So pretty good bull to kind of get uh, an idea from there. Another thing we can look at, and I'll go ahead and replay this one so you can see it, is when bulls are walking, uh, we can really evaluate them from a muscle standpoint. So look here in this stifle. You want to see that flex and bulge out. When it kind of bulges out there like that bull's doing, right there, that tells us he's got some pretty good muscle expression. And, and when we get in behind him, we expect that bull's gonna be a little thicker there. Another thing you can look at from a structural standpoint is if those bulls are walking with their head down and low all the time, that, that's not necessarily a good thing either. So you're really looking for him to at least be level or like this case, this bull, he kind of holds his head up a little above level, which is, is really nice and attractive there and indicates he's, he's moving pretty easy as well. So here's another example, and I'll let you kind of look at it for a few seconds, and you can decide whether you think he's moving pretty good or not, and then I'll tell you what I think, and then we can finish watching the video. So if you look at this Angus bull here, he is moving pretty easy uh, from a structural standpoint, no big red flags. You can actually see shoulder flex a little bit better on him. And then when you look at his rear legs there, notice how that rear leg actually goes back just a little bit right here. That's what we want. You actually see a lot of times when we're dealing with Angus bulls um, is they're so sick of hawk that that leg won't go all the way back there. Uh, and that tends to lead to a little bit shallower heel and a little bit longer toe. But another example of a bull that's walking pretty smoothly there. So 
And you can see how that leg, that hawk straightens out and he just goes back past just a little bit there. Again, kind of pretty level with his head. He's got it held up at a, at a decent height for us there. And just walk pretty smoothly. Okay, so I'll let you take a look at this bull and see what you think. And hopefully everybody's seeing that that bull's not walking as smoothly as those two previous bulls we saw. This is a bull that I would mark off my list that regardless of how good he was everywhere else, I would not be interested in purchasing this bull from a structural standpoint, what I really want you to watch in the second half of this video is watch this hawk. Instead of naturally flexing it, he actually pops it pretty violently. And he also is popping down here on his pasture in a little bit, which is likely tied to the way that hawk is. We'll see some bulls, especially in certain breeds, they'll pop down on the pasture here. Um, this is one of the few that I've really seen that pop this severely up in the hawk here. So go ahead and watch that for the rest of the video. So you can see how it kind of snaps. It's not nice and gradual and smooth flex in there. It's actually a violent pop. So that's something we would definitely worry about that bull from a longevity standpoint moving forward. So even if you didn't notice exactly what it was, hopefully you just noticed he wasn't walking as smoothly and easily as those two previous bulls. So this is a heifer here, but another example of some structure we can look at. So again, hopefully when you see her, you think, man, she's not moving too smooth uh, here. So this, this would be something we would wanna avoid, whether it's on a bull or a heifer. She's just got some real issues on her rear legs. Uh, she's not made quite right in that hawk. And then where her leg bone here ties down into the pasture and foot, we have some issues there. She, she's just not made right. But real cumbersome in her movement. And you can actually see her, she kind of rocks back and forth a little bit up here in her pelvis as well. Don't worry about dissecting all the little problems. Just look at her and say, hey, she's not moving right. That's going to be something I want to avoid from a structural standpoint. Look at this bull here and see if you notice anything visually that we may want to pay attention to on him. And I'm going to tell you, I didn't put him in here so much from a structural standpoint. Let me play him again. How many of you noticed he's got a big abscess up here on the top of his head? Okay, so that that's something, he may be the best in the world on paper and may be good in other areas, but that's something I would, that would really stick out to me. Um, maybe you're okay with that and you wanna figure that into to your budget situation, but that's also a signal to me, how much detail is that breeder paying attention to those animals? I wouldn't wanna put a bull in the sale that had a big abscess on the top of his head like that. So that's one of the real nice things when we're seeing more and more of these bull cells that have videos that you can look at ahead of time. You can really sort through those bulls on video real quick and make that list a whole lot shorter that you need to look at uh, when you actually get to see those bulls in person. Look at this bull here just from a, a general visual appraisal standpoint as well. So if we look at that bull from the side view, that's a pretty attractive bull, balanced up pretty well. He moves he moves pretty well. He's not real great in a sheath design. Uh, gets a little pendulous and a little more sheath there. Um, but the thing hopefully you really noticed about this bull is this bull tends to get pretty light muscled and get pretty narrow made. So kind of watch him when he turns about how narrow he actually is when you get behind him. And if you watch that stifle uh, compared to that first bull, 
we looked at, he just doesn't have near the shape and expression in that stifle. So what I'm talking about is right here. It flexes, but it doesn't pop out. And that's what you really, you really want to see. You just don't see near as much expression down here in the stifle and lower quarter. And when you get behind that bull, that bull just gets a little, you can really see it right there. When he turns, you can really just see how he gets a little narrower in his makeup. So when we talk about we want a bull with some natural thickness and some muscle shape and expression, that would be a bull that was just kind of lacking those things. All right, so I mentioned on that bull as well is sheath angle and design, and that's something we definitely want to pay attention to on our Brahmin influence cattle. So this is what we're, we're looking for, some nice angle here. Yes, there's some sheath, but we have some angle and we're, we're not pendulous there. We're starting to get slightly pendulous, and that just means we're at a little greater risk of maybe getting an injury in that bull down the road from uh, his sheath and uh, penis getting stepped on in an injury there. And definitely when we get real pendulous like this, this is not what we would be looking for. So as a seed stock producer, that's probably, you don't want to be using a bull like that uh, to be raising other bulls because they are going to pass that trade on. If you're buying bulls for commercial use and you're sending those all those animals to, to sell, then you just have to think about the risk of an injury there. And if we're in just pretty clean pastures and we don't have but that one bull in there, the risk may not be too high. But if we're in some brushy country or have a lot of bulls together, um, then we're at greater risk. And so you may just want to think about how much risk you're willing to take there and, and how you may want to adjust your budget in that situation to account for some of that risk. So there's a lot of information out there. We need to really think about what information is gonna be most important to look at in our situation. So I'm gonna tell you in all situations, regardless of what your goal is, I'm gonna to wanna to pay attention to scrotal circumference. I'm gonna to wanna to look at maximum actual birth weight. Um, I, don't, I don't want those birth weights too heavy. I'm gonna kind of have a cutoff there. Now that's gonna change a little bit depending on where I'm at. If I'm in Texas versus if I'm in North Dakota, we can have identical genetics in Texas and North Dakota and the, those calves up north will be eight to 10 pounds heavier at birth just because of the colder temperatures and how that affects blood flow. Here in the Southern United States, we'll see a difference between calves that are born in the fall versus calves that are born in the spring. Those calves that are born in the fall will typically be roughly about five pounds lighter at birth than the same ones born in the spring. And then if we start doing ET in there, that can impact some things as well. Calving ease direct is important. We got to get a live calf on the ground and then docility uh, for all the reasons we talked about earlier. So let's just say we're selling wean calves or yearlings. We're looking at a terminal sire situation, meaning we're selling everything. We're not going to keep anything. So those traits we talked about on the previous slide, they're still going to be important. They're important in every situation. So that calving ease and docility. But in addition here, I'm looking at yearling weight. And in this situation, the more yearling weight I can get, the better. And you can look at weaning weight. But if we think about weaning those calves at seven, eight months of age in a commercial operation, and then we precondition them for another 60 days, I really like to focus more on that yearling weight EPD than I do the wean and weight EPD. So the higher the number that yearling weight EPD is, the more growth we would expect out of those calves. I'm gonna look at actual data. I'm always gonna look at scroll circumference to make sure those bulls that are hitting some minimums. I really don't want any bulls below 32 and, and really I, I wanna be at 34 better in, in most situations. But personally, I probably would take anything off the list that was less than 32 unless we're talking about straight Brahmin. And I'm talking about it at a year of age. Um, and then in some breeds, so those breeds that just don't have as much genomic data or they just don't have as many animals in the breed, or we're not quite as far along in the genomics and the EPDs, I'm still going to want to look at the birth weights and the yearling weights on those animals. If it's a breed where we have thousands and thousands of animals with genomic data and phenotypic data on, 
I'm probably just going to look at the EPD in that situation. So examples there would be things like Angus for sure, uh, Simmental, um, Red Angus and Hereford are, are pretty far along in their, their process as well. When we look at some of the smaller breeds, we just don't, they may have some genomic testing, we're just not quite as far there. I'm personally still going to want to look at that actual data as well. And then if you were going to be selling truckload lots, even though you're going to be selling those animals, you may still want to pay a little attention um, to carcass traits if it may help you marketing there. If you're just selling those animals through a preconditioned KF sale or your local weekly auction, those carcass traits just aren't going to be real important in that situation. When we think about keeping replacement heifers, it gets a little more complex. We're going to be looking at definitely many more traits than we did in that terminal SAR situation. From an EPD standpoint, we'll be looking at Cavanese Direct again. I don't get worried about Cavanese maternal. Some folks look at that. You just got to be careful. You can start to select for bigger and bigger cows with that. So I, I don't worry about Cavanese maternal very much or at all personally. Uh, yearling weight. And here's a case, if I'm keeping replacement heifers, I'm not necessarily trying to maximize that yearling weight because a lot of times if I try to maximize that yearling weight, I start making heifers that are going to turn into bigger and bigger cows. So I may want to be a little more moderate in my growth traits. If they have a docility PD, I'm definitely going to be looking at that. If not, I'm definitely checking the uh, docility in person on those bulls. And even if they do have an EPD, I'm still checking docility in person. Heifer pregnancy EPD, if it is available. Milk EPDs, and this is really gonna depend on your environment. Uh, in the Eastern half of the state over here in a higher rainfall area, we can definitely support more milk in those cows than if you could out West. Most of the time, if you'll just avoid both extremes, so not necessarily the heavy milk in, milking animals and not necessarily the lowest milking, just something in the middle works pretty good. If I have some feet EPDs available, I'm gonna pay attention to that. Think about from a longevity standpoint and not having to call those animals because we're getting into some lameness issues. Uh, marbling or fat, okay? I just realized to put docility on there twice, maybe that subconscious on how much I pay attention to that. We've already talked about birth weight previously, but here I'm gonna be looking at weaning weight as well. And that can kind of give me some indication. If I look at the weaning weight of this bull and he's much lower compared to his contemporaries, that may give me an indication his dam didn't milk real well. So that's something to think about there. Again, if it's a breed where I have plenty of data, I'm really going to focus much more on the EPD than I will the actual information. And since we are keeping heifers, we're going to be thinking about that pedigree as well. So when we're buying bulls, decide what traits are going to be most important to you. Figure out what your goals are. Figure out the size of your operation. If you're sitting there and you only have, you know, two, three, four, five cows, it may not be worth it to go out there and buy a bull. And definitely you gotta be cautious on how much you spend. In those situations, you may actually look at working with your neighbors and seeing if you can work out an arrangement with your neighbor that can be easier for both of you in the long run. Um, if you're running a few more cows, then definitely you're, you're looking at buying bulls. Uh, the more information we can get on those bulls, the, the better off we're gonna be. Uh, so decide what kind of some minimum and maximum acceptable values for each trait are for you. Don't worry about every trait. Figure out the few that are going to be most important and really focus on them. Keep it simple. There's some bull cell catalogs out there. They'll have 50 pieces of information on that bull just printed in the catalog. There's no reason we need to be looking at every bit of that. Figure out a few things that are going to be most important and really focus in on those. So a lot of people get real obsessed about weaning weight or yearly weight and the more I can get, the better. And yes, in terminal sire situation, that's good, but we also have to keep Cavanese in mind. We have to get that live calf on the ground. And just to kind of show you how important getting that live calf is, I want to walk through a little bit of math here. So let's say 500 pound steer, uh, 
bringing about $750 and realize there's a lot of change in the market, but this would be realistic for, for kind of what we've seen on and off the last few years and probably moving forward in a lot of situations. Uh, if you're selling them truckload lots, they're going to be bringing more than that. But 500 pounds deer bringing $750. We talk about value of gain. Value of gain is how much is each additional pound of weight worth. And typically it's going to run from about 75 cents to 85 cents. I'll usually figure 80 cents on average. But to be even more conservative here, I went ahead to the higher end of that range at 85 cents. So if I say each calf is worth $750, if I divide that $750 that that calf is worth by 85 cents, that tells me I would have to add 883 pounds to the rest of the calf crop to make up for one calf I potentially lost. So that just really tells us how important getting that live calf is on the ground. If we look at a high performing bull, getting an extra 25 pounds of weaning weight would be kind of the top end of things. You'll hear people talk about, well, I gained 75 pounds wean and weight when I switch from this breed to that breed. Typically that has to do more with environmental conditions that year, or maybe they were using a breed that's just not really a, a good beef breed and they moved over to a higher performing breed. If we're looking at our major breeds and looking at moving from the lower end to the higher end of the breed, 25 pounds is a pretty big move. So if we think about that bull, potentially uh, being exposed to 30 cows. So 30 cows, getting an 83% calf crop out of them, it's gonna be kind of industry average. That means that bull in a year sired 25 calves. 25 calves times that 25 pounds of additional weaning weight, we only realized 625 pounds. To make up for one lost calf, we talked about needing 883. So if we look at from an economic standpoint in a commercial cow-calf operation, sacrificing a little bit of performance in some situations to make sure we get acceptable uh, birth weight and calving ease for the type of females we're breeding them to is definitely going to be important there. Another thing to think about is just what do you have tied up in a bull? And so I know there's a lot, this is actually out of a spreadsheet for those of you who attended the annual cow cost uh, workshop, this came out of that spreadsheet. So you can kind of look at some different scenarios, not telling you what you need to pay for a bull or not, but just work some numbers in here so you can kind of see it. So if we look at purchase price and for first two scenarios, I used 2000 for scenario C, I used 4000. Look at salvage value on that bull when we're selling him, $1,800. Then it calculates depreciation, or, or I call it genetic cost, on a bull. So $200 there, $2,200 there. A big thing people forget about is maintenance cost on those bulls. So uh, figuring about $600 a year right now, not as high as what it would be on a cow. Uh, how many years did we use that bull? Four years. Uh, and then it's set up where you can put in how many cows you exposed him to if you used him as a yearling or that first year, and then how many cows year after. Total number of cows he was exposed to during his lifetime. How does that break down from a cost standpoint on genetic cost or depreciation? So you're looking at a little less than $3 here, about $20 here. Maintenance cost, $35. 22. Now, the reason that difference is on maintenance is he's exposed over that four year period to 35 more cows. So I can break that cost down across more cows. Um, same number of cows, but now I spent more on that bull. So you can see how that affects your breeding cost per cow exposed. Didn't pay too much, but I didn't breed him to as many cows, $37. Paid the same, bred him to more cows, we're down to $25. Paid a little bit more, bred him to the same number of cows here, looking at just under $44. I tell you, most people probably need to be budgeting somewhere 
uh, around 35 to 40 dollars is going to be realistic if you're way above that you need to think about how that fits for your operation obviously if you're in the seed stock industry you're going to have more some people say well i I can pay a whole lot more because those calves are going to weigh more. We kind of looked at that a little bit on the previous slide, but also look at it here some. Think about that. Um, and there's some questions I see come in. Let me finish this slide and then I'll, I'll get to those questions. Look at this here. When we talk about going from the 75th percentile to the 10th percentile on the Angus breed, I would add 25 pounds of weaning weight. So if I take that 25 pounds times my 80 cents value of gain, yeah, I increased, I generated probably $20 more in value in calf. I got to see how that works with how much more I paid for those animals. Look at Charlay, we had increased at 17 pounds on current percentile tables going from 75 to 10. So one of the first questions that came in is, uh, somebody said they would love to rent a high-performing bull, but TRIP keeps a lot of breeders from considering renting. And I would tell you, I would avoid renting or leasing bulls for that exact reason. Uh, there is a trick test out there. That test is not 100% by any means. And no, I do not see that changing in the future. Uh, the only time I'd really consider that is if you're a small producer and it's a neighbor situation, you're already dealing with the hassle of that bull jumping the fence, uh, I may consider that in that situation, but otherwise I would be very leery of renting bulls. Uh, I'd be much more comfortable with going out and purchase me a moderate performing bull and taking that risk out of the equation. So the question is, is half British the best mix for East Texas? I'm gonna ask you to maybe chat in a little bit more. Are you talking about from a calf standpoint or from a bull standpoint? From a bull standpoint, we're typically wanna, gonna to wanna to buy a straight bred bull. Uh, when we're talking about selling those calves at a local market, we just wanna make sure we do have at least a half British in there, but we can do that with several different Situation. So, for example, we could take, um, or I should say, we don't want more than a half uh, British a lot of times just because uh, we, we want to maximize some of those other things. So, a very common situation for East Texas would be something like a Brangus type cow or a Beef Master uh, or Santa Gertrudis type cow. So, that cow has got a little Brahmin influence in British. And then we could breed that cow back to an Angus bull or Charlay bull. Any of those crosses would work very well from a marketing standpoint. Another question that came in is how old should a bull be when you need to sell him? Uh, how many cows can a bull cover? So there's no exact age when you need to sell him. Uh, typically, uh, most times we don't get more than about four years out of a bull just because of fighting and injuries and those kind of things. If you're in a situation where you're only dealing with one bull in the herd, we definitely get more use out of those bulls a lot of times in that situation. I'd feel very comfortable using that bull at seven, eight years of age. Just want to, as he starts getting older, you may consider doing your breeding soundness exam uh, at least every year on him or definitely watch and make sure you're not having those cows come back in the heat. So the, as long as he's still getting around good and breeding cows, there's no certain age I'm gonna sell him. Now, if you're keeping replacement heifers out of him, basically you're gonna to get to use him for two years before you need to sell him if, because he would then be breeding his daughters back. So a lot of factors uh, that are gonna influence how long we may have that bull before we sell him. Okay, another question that came in is when you see weaning weights, is that typical the weaning weight at seven months of age or what age? So from an EPD standpoint, that's going to be uh, 205 days of age, so just short of seven months. On an adjusted weaning weight, we should adjust to that, but be careful. Some people, because it looks better from a marketing standpoint, may give you an actual weaning weight, and those animals could be uh, quite a bit older than that. So EPD, you're gonna be pretty consistent. If it says adjusted 205, you know what it is. 
If it's an actual, you're just gonna have to ask exactly what that weaning weight was. It should be a bit of a red flag if they're giving you actual weaning weights and not adjusted weaning weights. Question came in, is weaning at six months of age too early? No, typically in the industry, we'll, we'll think about weaning at six to eight months of age in commercial operations. We can actually wean as early as 60 days of age uh, if we're in a drought situation, but that requires some different management in those situations. So I think I got all those questions. If I miss one, um, if you'll just go ahead and type it back in. So one of them came in, how many cows can a bull cover? In our environment, uh, I personally am very comfortable with exposing bulls after their first breeding season to 25, 30, 35 cows. Uh, you'll hear a lot of people talk about a one to 25 ratio. They're just being a little more conservative there. So whatever you're comfortable with, like I said, I'm, I'm very comfortable with 30 or 35 and personally have gone even higher than that. We've, we've run more, but 30 to 35, I think is very realistic for a bull after his first breeding season in, in the East Texas environment. Now, if we were out in West Texas and we were running a cow-calf pair to 100 acres, then I'm gonna be much more conservative on my bull to cow ratio. And I may be looking at a, a bull to 15, cows in that situation. Um, but in this environment, I'm comfortable with 25 to 35 and personally very comfortable with 30 to 35. If he's a yearling bull, I'm probably going to be looking at 10 to 15 uh, females that first year, depending on how much he's developed. Uh, question is, is that for a 60 day breeding season? Yes, that would be a 60 to 90 day breeding season. I don't have it in this data in this presentation, but there's actually some data showing bulls on synchronized females. They really didn't see a difference on how many females those bulls bred, uh, whether they're exposing them to five females or 50 plus females in a couple day period. So over a 60 or 90 day season, yes, that's, that's very comfortable. Just to wrap up with a few more quick comments and feel free to keep asking those questions and, and we'll get to those. If you do need to go ahead and log off, feel free to do that. But I got about three to five more minutes of slides here and then we'll take some more questions. So we talked about scroll circumference um, and I told you minimum, I would wanna see those bulls at least at 32 at a year of age, preferably 34. That's going to impact my bull to cow ratio. So if I start getting real high on those bull to cow ratios, I don't want to do that on a real small testicle bull because when we look at scrotal circumference, that's going to impact a couple of things. One of those is the probability of that bull having satisfactory semen quality is going to increase as he moves from 30 to 38 centimeters. So not that bull particularly, but when we compare it a year of age, if we had a bull that was 30 centimeters at a year of age versus one that was 38, we would typically expect to see better semen quality on that bull that was higher. Now we can get them too big. Uh, I wouldn't want typically a bull that's going to be over about 45 centimeters at a year of age. Uh, but definitely there is some advantage when we go from 30 to 38 at a year of age. The other thing is that scroll circumference is gonna be highly correlated to total sperm output. And it's also moderately correlated to morphology or how normal those, uh, that sperm is. Okay, 32 is gonna be centimeters, not inches. So just, just make sure uh, we, we double check that. The other thing that that changes a little bit is how much were those bulls developed? So if that bull's just been on grass and I hadn't been growing him very much and he's, he's not weighing as much, then I'm, gonna hit, I'm not gonna be as strict on him. I'm gonna expect that to be a couple centimeters lower. If those bulls are extremely fat, they'll deposit that extra fat down in that scrotum and so they may not actually be quite as big as what you think they are. Roughly, and, and there's not good data, but just to tell you the number I kind of use, on those bulls that are pretty fat, I'll typically subtract two to three centimeters off of them to, to kind of adjust them back to a more normal situation. 
Uh, TRIC was mentioned in one of the questions earlier. Uh, for those of you who may not be as familiar with TRIC, it is a venereal disease uh, caused by a protozoal parasite. Once that bull gets it, he has it. You're not, there's no approved treatment. He's not gonna show any symptoms. It's not gonna affect his semen quality or sexual behavior, but what it does is those cows, he's gonna breed that cow, that cow's gonna get pregnant, and then the cows that he passed that trick protozoa on to, they'll actually abort. And so you can actually see your pregnancy rates go from 90, 95%. And a lot of times we'll see those cut in half down to 50% or so. So definitely want to pay attention to that. And that's why we don't want to be buying bulls with unknown reproductive history. And that's why I think leasing bulls is a very high risk endeavor. Okay, question is, is it good to buy a young bull and let him be with your older bull for a year and then sell the old bull? I would really prefer not to do that. The reason being is if you put that young bull in with that older bull, you greatly increase the risk of that young bull getting injured. So I would sell the old bull and then put the young bull in there. Or if you want a little uh, backup plan, just move the old bull uh, to a separate pasture, put the young bull in there. If you start seeing some problems, then you could switch them out. But when we're talking about bulls, multiple bulls being in the same pasture, we wanna make sure those bulls are of similar age and similar size. If we have differences in age and size there, we definitely increase risk of injury in that situation. Another thing that can happen is that bigger bull can whoop on that young bull so much it really reduces his interest in breeding cows. Uh, so, so don't want to mix those bulls of different ages. Question is, are there situations where a fertile bull doesn't breed? Absolutely. Uh, that can have to do with his libido, which is just saying his interest in breeding activity. And we do have situations where the bull may be fine on a breeding soundness exam but he just doesn't have interest in breeding cows. That's why it's important to make sure you, you watch the cows and see when that bull breeds them and jot that down and then see if those cows start to come back into heat um, or if they're in heat and he just doesn't have any interest in them, jot it down. It may be some bulls, you just don't see them breed very much. They may breed at night or those kind of things, but right that cow that comes into heat down see if she comes into heat again um, in 18 to 21 days there. Uh, if she's coming into heat, then we're gonna, if you have multiple cows coming back in heat, we're gonna start looking at problems. All right, well, I don't see any other questions. So thank you everybody for joining us tonight. And with that, I'll go ahead and end the meeting.